This is a detailed scene-by-scene -scene analysis of the Butto's Labyrinth, the opening level of Psychonauts 2. In it we'll explore storytelling, music, dialogue, visual design, game design, easter eggs and bloopers. We'll also discuss how Hollywood films from the likes of Lucas and Hitchcock have shaped the game, and take a look at the unique ingredients that make up a mental landscape. Three days ago, Truman Zanotto, the grand head of the Psychonauts, was kidnapped. Here we see the folds of the brain gradually transform into cubicles. All the while, office detritus, chairs, mugs, computers, float towards the bottom of the screen. This gives the impression that the items are floating in the brain jar liquid. With hindsight, these floating objects and half-formed cubicles represent the outer limits of the office construct. It's as if less attention has been allocated to its construction, a foreshadowing, perhaps, that this place is set to come apart at the seams. As the camera settles on this overhead shot, we see one of those popular swing and ball desk toys in motion. There's a comic element to the way these desks are decorated. These are items stereotypical to the office environment, but there's a sense that the designer has gone overboard. The hero's disappointment becomes clear as the scene plays out. You will hear the Psychonauts theme underscoring the dialogue, except it sounds sadder, more wistful. I don't know. It's just... I've dreamed about working at Psychonauts headquarters all my life. I just thought it would be more... you know? Come on. Again, we have another theme played in a minor mode. This one titled The Adventure Begins, but it's left unfinished, as if to say the hero's adventure has not yet truly begun. And that's how we managed to raise profits the uh, 900% this quarter. That's right. That trumpet fanfare is a classic example of the Mickey Mouse technique. It's an old-fashioned technique that gets its name from cartoons. But you'll come across it in more dramatic fare too. Here's an example from Casablanca. Listen to the stinger that plays when Ilsa suddenly points her gun at Rick. Now, you. All right. Quite simply, Mickey Mouse is the close matching of the music with the visual action. With that in mind, let's play out the rest of the meeting. Thank you! And that brings us to our next topic. Uh, Sasha, still have the talking turtle? Oh. Sorry, I just like the clapping. It's now time to give out the award for Employee of the Year. The prize for this year's award is an all-expenses-paid tropical vacation. Ooh! Oh, I hope it's me! The winner of this award may be one of our newest members, but he's also one of our most improved. Congratulations to Caligosto Lobato! What? Mm. Way to go, Cal! You're gonna love this vacation package. Ah, jealous. No, darling. All you need to do is get this vacation request approved by your supervisor. What? Just a formality. You just need to get this form signed by your boss. My boss? Yes, darling. Or you could just tell us who your boss is and we could... No! Maybe he doesn't want this tropical vacation after all. Look back. I want it. I'm employee of the year. Yes, you are, darling. Now off you go. Get that form signed by your boss. The person who hired you. The person you work for. Okay. Hurry up before I take that vacation myself. Rasputin? I'm on him. Keep up with you. From here the play will come across a cluster of cartoonish looking wooden signs. They look like the sort of signs Wally Coyote would put up to lure the roadrunner into a trap. They serve as signposting for the player, as well as Lobato. They also indicate that the space has been put together rather hastily. But don't freak him out. Divert your attention from the target and you'll find plenty of other phony looking items. There were questionable work policies nonsensical pie charts, and conga lines of light switches. The switches all look bent out of shape. In the world of Psychonauts, there are few items that are in shape. 
This is largely due to the design philosophy of the game's original concept artists, Peter Chan and Scott Campbell. As Chan puts it, the Psychonauts world is asymmetrical. There's attention to the shapes. Objects are depicted out of proportion, and when placed in the series, they are often messily arranged. Bodies, faces and facial features come in all shapes and sizes. Eyes don't always match up. Tiles are uneven. Walls are cracked. Picture frames are crooked. This is a funhouse world, devised of crazy angles and warped proportions, where things rarely sit still, nor straight. Following me? Levels function according to their own weird dream logic. We're about to get a taste of that up ahead. Before that point, the designers originally planned to build an impossible corner. That is a corner which would take the player around in an illogical circle. It was, however, deemed a touch excessive. It didn't disappear entirely, though. You can find one such corner in Bob's mental landscape. Wait a minute! The lengthening of this corridor is accompanied by a perspective trick stolen from film. You recognize the effect from Alfred Hitchcock's Vertigo, from which it gets its name. The Vertigo effect is achieved by moving the camera backward on the subject while zooming in at the same time. This is the visual equivalent of pulling the rug from under the player's feet, or it's like encountering that first unexpected twist in the roller coaster. Things will only get weirder from here. I think you understand the gravity of the situation. Oh, watch out! <laughs> if the player is quick enough, they will see the bottom step through that door up top. If not, you can always see it happen in the speed run. <laughs> Coach! No time for small talk, soldier! This issue like geometry recalls thorny towers from the first game. But we've got them cornered! This one! Raz and the coach are dropped into a cylindrical bin. You may have noticed that the levels in Psychonauts rarely take place in rectangular rooms. This is due to Tim Schafer's anti shoebox stance. Place the player in a rounder, more asymmetric, more open environment, and they can more fully immerse themselves in the fantasy of the game. This stance can be strongly felt throughout this level, as the boxy office flares out into a fantastical fairy tale landscape. When you see a figment, suck it up, soldier! So whenever you see a figment, suck it up, soldier! Well, let's soldier through, Private! Unzip that dental door! Good job, soldier! What's that light? Uh-oh. Zip it back up again! These Lobato cutscenes act as bridges between one area and the next. The tutorial level has a very seamless flow to it. However, that flow is broken upon return, as you need to use the teleportation creature to access all areas. A common criticism of the sequel was that the levels felt too disconnected as a result of this cutscene-heavy approach. While the initial playthrough provides a seamless roller coaster experience, it comes at the expense of post-level exploration. Coach. After bashing out the sensors, you're free to explore the central office, where Lobato's toothy contraptions have broken through to the surface. Around the perimeter behind glass, you'll find office chairs and tables floating upside down, reminiscent of that office detritus seen in the opening cutscene. There's also an odd-looking painting of a woman in a shapeless dress. This comes from a painting called Grandma, kept in the real-life office of Double Fine. Find that way. See you on the other side. It looks like some sort of conference room in here. There's a strong sense of dental invasion as this sinuous conference table turns into a tongue and the chairs give way to teeth. Rasputin, careful, it's a oof! Sasha, how is Lobato breaking through the office construct? He couldn't be doing this on his own. He must be getting help from someone even more... sinister. There's been some discussion about this snippet of dialogue. If there's someone more sinister is non-psychic, then how have they committed psychic sabotage? 
Back in the lab, Sasha comments that someone has conditioned Lobato hypnotically to not reveal the truth about his boss. These psychic booby traps could be Lobato's heightened mental defense mechanisms kicking in as a result of MK Ultra style hypnotic conditioning. Alternatively, the saboteur may have had access to a psychic hypnosis device, such as the one Otto alludes to. The third possibility is that there is a third party involved who possesses psychic powers. If not Otto, then maybe someone only mentioned in passing, like the wife of the former ruler of Grulovia. There could be an extra level to this scheme, yet to be revealed. I, ooh, I've got the situation under our control. There's a bit of a blooper after this cutscene. Turn around and Sasha is nowhere to be seen. It seems like the programmers had difficulty making the scene playable. Just find us a way out of here, quickly. These tooth fairies wear tooth-shaped bowler hats. They act like a couple of mobsters, which is fitting given the interrogation theme. One of them is very fond of saying mook, a word popularized by Scorsese's Mean Streets. And we don't pay mooks. Mook. I'm a mook. Yeah. What's a mook? In general parlance, the word means a stupid or incompetent person. While in more informal contexts, such as in discussions of action films, comics or video games, it refers to those disposable standard issue goons who serve as cannon fodder for the hero. The signposting from the first corridor makes a reappearance, except the words have been defaced to change their meanings. They now carry more emotional charge. The mouthwash introduces a water element to the game. The platforming becomes more perilous from this point forward. Everything that does something. Oh no, not back in the trap. Coach, coach, where'd he go? Oh, well, that's a good sign. What is it? That is a regret. If Lobato has regrets... When Sasha was reintroduced, so is his character theme, called Sasha's Lab in the sequel. Your performance, young cadet, was outstanding. I'd like you to report to my lab for some advanced training. It's one of two tracks that has been remixed from the first game without full orchestration, the other being the forgetful forest. Take care of that one, will you, while I find an exit? Just like with the coach, Raz has been abandoned by his mentor and must take on the enemy alone. This comical theme occurs throughout, only losing its funny side by the level's end. The central office has much transformed since our last visit. The office furniture has been rearranged. More than that though, the roof has been ripped apart and teeth have torn through the walls. The wall art has gained a dental fixation and the Botto shows up in various forms. Hanging above his oil painting is a curious looking chandelier. Close by is some Andy Warhol styled pop art. Like a boss battle, this is only the second stage of the room's transformation. There is still one more stage to go. There's a lot of vintage themed posters hanging around. This one is based on the World War II propaganda poster. With the introduction of water, Vaz's curse enters the foreground. Interestingly, none of the characters make mention of the hand. They simply comment on Raz's fear of water. Even in the first game, fans read this as a clue that the curse only exists inside his head. And yeah, yeah, super sad. Look at these posters! There's an elaborate chandelier on the ceiling. With hindsight, it could be interpreted as the boss's presence looming overhead. Down below, the wooded floor is decorated with lightly shaded spiral patterns. These spirals are a key visual motif of the Psychonauts world. You'll find them embedded all across this landscape, and those to come. Lily saves the hero's neck. 
Unlike Sasha and the coach, the hero's female associates come to the hero's rescue. Raz will find himself in another sticky situation near the end of the game, from which he must once again be rescued by his girlfriend. In the first Psychonauts, Raz must rescue the damsel in semi-distress, but in the sequel that trope is reversed. It is the female lead who retrieves the treasure, and frees the hero. Schaefer lends his female characters much autonomy in these games. The tooth infested office has reached the final stage of its transformation. Gummy teeth press up against the glass, plaque scrapers intrude from a gaping hole in the roof, veins throb audibly on one side of the room. Even the chandelier has altered overhead, branching out to resemble the one seen in Lobato's office. Yes, darling. Milov is another one of Schaefer's well-defined female characters. In relation to Lobotto, Lily acts the bad cop and Miller the good cop. While Lily gives the subject the third degree and third degree burns, Miller considers him in a much more compassionate light. The poor thing looks terrified. Someone really did a number on that poor thing. I think he wants to tell us who hired him, but he's terrified. Let's find him and help him. Yep. Don't forget to flop, darling. The mission is falling apart. We've lost control of Lobato. The score is turned suitably more dramatic. Quivering strings accompany the hero's bumpy descent. The level directs the player deeper downwards or deeper into the subject's subconscious. Just as memory votes tend to be hidden out of sight, in the literal recesses of the mind, the character's darkest secrets tend to be buried deep within the subconscious. Thus levels tend to follow a downwards progression. I can't reach Mia. I think she's been dementistrated. Sasha? Coach? Lily? This dark fairy tale landscape is in stark contrast to the boxy office setting. The walls have entirely collapsed. There's no signposts, nor safety nets. There's no one to help the hero now. The dialogue makes clear of this. This is one of two environments from Psychonauts 1 that has been reimagined for the sequel. The other being the reception area with the carved wooden stumps. Across from the tower, far off in the distance is a glowing fire, no doubt meant to represent Whispering Rock. The soundtrack is laden with deep heavy brass mixed with the occasional high-pitched flute. This lends the landscape a subtle air of menace. I put, I put the old box in the and the egg in the ocean. Those sinister brass motifs are a trick straight from the John Williams handbook. In Indiana Jones, the appearance of a villain often coincides with low-pitched minor chords played on the trombone. Now. 
As the hero approaches the lab, the music plays a slow, disguised version of the Maligula theme. The composer is priming us for her appearance, on a subconscious level. Once again, McConnell's use of this theme pays tribute to the score of Indiana Jones. Similar to Maligula, the Ark from Raiders of the Lost Ark is an ancient power of biblical proportions. It's a death-dealing destroyer sought by the bad guys for its ability to lay waste to entire regions. The Bible speaks of the Ark leveling mountains and laying waste to entire regions. An army which carries the Ark before it is invincible. In typical bad guy fashion, the enemy don't heed the warnings. They make the mistake of thinking they can control its destructive power. Seeking to become godlike, they instead find themselves subjected to the wrath of God. When the ark is opened, Williams wanted to try and evoke a biblical atmosphere. He does this through the use of a female vocalizing choir and loud unmuted brass topped by a blaring of horns. But the music is made all the more powerful by what precedes it. Before Indy lays eyes on the actual ark, he first sees it in illustrated form. This is our first proper introduction to the Ark and to its musical theme, a dark foreboding melody that consists largely of three notes played in a downwards progression. You know, to understand Hitler's interest in this. Oh yes. The Bible speaks of the Ark leveling mountains and laying... In the beginning, we hear the theme in a more disguised form. The trumpets are muted, representing the latent power of the Ark. Later, when the Ark is finally unveiled, the theme is played forte with unmuted trumpets. The threat is represented as more real, more direct. It no longer looms in the background. In Psychonauts 2, Maligula's theme consists largely of four notes at fall and rise, giving off the impression of some dark and powerful creature stalking its prey. That sense of menace heightens as the story unfolds, and what was once a comic book fairy tale emerges as a real incredible threat. When the monster is finally unleashed, the strings swell into a whirlwind, the brass blasts forth, and the chorus rings loud and clear. Maligula is a monster of biblical proportions. That comes without question. The hero climbs the ladder and crosses the first significant threshold. This marks a turning point in the narrative. The following scene has a noirish sensibility. Schaefer is well versed in the world of film noir. Robert LucasArts, he directed Grim Fandango, an adventure game that blended film noir themes into an underworld setting inspired by Mexican mythology. Some of that influence seems to have rubbed off onto Lobato's lab. When Reyes crosses the threshold, we get a sneak peek into the interior of the lab. It's enveloped in shadow. The silhouetted bars of the window make it look like a prison. The butter is trapped in the doomed situation. That's not it. Put the old box in the basket and the egg in the ocean. The boss is dressed top to toe in shadow. This is similar to how the conspiratorial boss is portrayed in Grimm. And the old egg in the box and the box in the ocean. Fans of the first game will know that eggs are synonymous with brains. The basket in the ocean refers to the chest that was found together with Truman and the rhombus of ruin. It's a buried treasure of sorts. No, not her. Maligula's appearance is preceded by a pinkish purple light. A low pitched pedal point drones along with a mysterious wind sound, rising in intensity. Maligula is an example of the femme fatale, a disastrous woman who holds a seductive sway over men. She also holds sway over sea serpents, shapeshifters long regarded as symbols of treachery. Her long seaweed-like hair billows as if underwater. Similar to Dracula, she only seems to come out at night. Bouncing on the waves below her are oddly shaped objects adorned with a fish scale pattern. On closer inspection, these are the flooded buildings of Grulovia. This is a nightmare scene. The hand of Galocchio reaches out from the depths and breaks the fourth wall. There's an element of subjectivity involved. The next thing we will see is a close-up of Vaz waking up with a start. But before then, the screen fades to black to signify the end of Act 1. 
That's just the first level of the game, but I think it's the most streamlined, with the storyteller, music and gameplay working in tandem to create a seamless narrative ride. It's a delicious appetizer before the main course, and it's a great showcase for everything this series has to offer. Are you taking so long? <laughs>